All right. Thank you. So, as Dima said, my name is Scott Gramaze, and I work for Rails Reactor. I had a product here. The title of this presentation is Digital Product Management American Style. I'm not sure if that's the best title, because here's what I don't know. I don't know that I or we do anything any differently than you do here. Let me ask you guys something. How many people here are developers? You write code. All right, how many people are product managers? You manage products of some sort. Okay, a handful. How many of you are project managers, which is different than pro Okay. How many of you do something else? What? Product marketing. Product marketing. Set designer. What else? I'm sorry? QA. QA, okay. All right. So there's a lot of different people in the room that have different tasks. My hope is that you're going to learn something here tonight, but I think one of three things is going to happen. Either you'll learn a lot from me, and that makes everybody happy. You'll learn one or two things that are useful, and that's also good. You may learn nothing, but that'll teach you something too. What that'll mean is that we all do things the same way. So let's get going. Let's get going. Let's get going. Let's get going slower. Uh, as I said, my name's Scott Gramaze product management leader here at Rails Reactor. I've worked at a lot of different companies, a lot of different startups. About.com is one of them. It's now called .dash. Keep.com. Some of these you might not have heard of because they're obviously US-based and they're targeted for US companies. This is my email. By the way, whatever I talk about here, don't worry. If there's something you're interested in, don't worry about taking notes or pictures. We're going to post this online and Dima will send that out to you. Um, Okay, there's my LinkedIn if you ever want to know more about me for some reason. And we're going to keep going. Maybe. Dima? Okay. All right. So here's some of the topics we're going to go over in no particular order. And by the way, I'm not going to read every single slide. All right, we're going to go over things. And that's why I said don't worry if you feel you're missing something because we're going to post the presentation. Also, I appreciate the fact that you guys all learned English. All right, to come here and listen to me or to work with U.S. clients. So if there's something you don't understand, that's my fault, not yours, because your English is a lot better than my Russian, which is basically like this. Next time I come here, maybe that'll change slowly in marketing, too, for the marketing guy. Okay. All right, traditional product management. How is it different than regular product management? It's not that much. The short answer, what do product managers actually do? What we're trying to do is figure out what it is that we should be doing. Are we doing the right things at all? A lot of people here write code, or you manage products, or you do project management. But are we wasting our time? Are we doing the right things in the first place? And that's what product management is about. So at a really high level, what does any business do? It's supposed to create value, usually financial value. That's slightly different for not-for-profits, of course. Not-for-profits that don't make money, that maybe do philanthropy or they're trying to help people. They don't necessarily make money, but they still have products of some sort. So there are slightly different motivations, but the concepts still apply. So, excuse me. <coughs> By the way, since I've been here, one of the first things, that one of the things they tell you about doing presentations is never apologize, just keep going. But I've been here, they, be, they make me talk a lot here. So my voice is a little bit raspy sometimes, so please forgive that. So the, the second thing it does, that businesses have to do is extract value. So I have to create value, but then I have to extract value. And my goal is to extract more value than I'm spending. All right, I want to make a profit. I want to stay alive. I want to stay in business. So first I have to create something that anybody cares about. Sometimes it's called the WIFM, W-I-F-M, the what's in it for me, for the consumer. Because nobody really cares about what it is you want to produce. They care about their problems and what they want to consume. So your job is to sort out how we're going to do these things. Marty Kagan wrote a book called Inspired. And he says, the job of the product manager is to discover a product that is valuable, usable, and feasible. Valuable, usable, and feasible. Sounds a little like minimum viable product. You've probably heard that term, right, these days in agile project management. Let's do minimum viable product. There's a lot of minimal going on. I'm not sure how much is actually viable, okay? And that's something we'll get into in a little bit. So there's a more formal answer from the product management kings or something. And they say a product manager takes the high-level vision for a product through creation and deployment to a marketplace in order to build business value. 
which is kind of what I said earlier about businesses creating and extracting value. But I think it's a little bit different. I think you're a bit of a marketer and an interpreter. I'll give you an example. I'm going to stand here. Let's pretend all of you guys are developers and all of you guys are marketers. When I talk to the developers, they think I'm one of the marketing people because I know a little bit about code and I can use some you know, fancy technical language, but they know I really can't pound code very well, or at least they don't want me to. But when I go over here, if I talk to the marketers, they think I'm one of the technology people, all right? Because, you know, so, so the marketers think I'm a tech person, the tech people think I'm one of the marketing people. I sort of stand in the middle. My job is to interpret those things, is to take business strategy and work with technology to make something of value out in the world. So to some degree, it's an interpreter. So here's some news for you if you want to be a product manager. It's kind of bad news, okay? Companies can probably do without you for quite some time, especially startups and small companies. It's mostly startups, though, because after all, as I said, you're not creating art, you're not writing code. What are you actually doing? But here's the good news. Companies are increasingly likely to value you as they grow up because as they get more established, they need product managers, and we're going to talk a little bit about why. Screwdrivers. Anybody here ever use a screwdriver? No? Wow, that's bad. Okay, I mean, crowd participation. So there's a lot of different screwdrivers here, right? If I were to do an exercise here, we're not going to do it because we don't have that much time, but if I gave everybody a piece of paper and I said, I want you to design a screwdriver for me and I want you to write a little bit about what it's used for, I could probably collect that. I'm going to get 50 different answers. I'm going to get 50 different pictures. Why? There's slotted, there's Phillips, there's Torx. There, there's a different type, bunch of types of screwdrivers, right? And should they be long or short? Should they ratchet so that they can screw things in more easily? Do they need insulated handles so I can work with electrical things? Do they need to be magnetic or do they need to be non-magnetic? The point is, unless you know a lot of information about your customer and what they're going to use this for, how can you design this? Right. There's a lot of stuff going on in this industry where we just put things together without a lot of customer participation. And when we do that, sometimes we're going to lose. How many of you have ever used a shovel to dig anything? You have? You have. What kind of shovel did you use? What did you dig? To plant trees. Okay. What kind of shovel? Did it have a big tip on the end or a little tip? or? <coughs> Oh, it's too big for you. I'm sorry. Um, did you buy the shovel or someone else? Oh, that's very nice of her. That was nice. She said, I need a shovel, and she bought, got it for you. So there were probably a lot of shovels at the store. You have some selection. How did you pick that one? No, that's a great reason. Whenever I need a shovel, I always get a red one, too. It doesn't matter what I need to shovel. Here's the point. I'm not sure. Did you really need a shovel, or did you need a hole? There you go. So you get the point. You know this, and you guys know this. So, so it's not about the shovel. It's not about the features or the functions. It's about the benefit. There's something I want to do. There's something I want to accomplish in the world. So I'm going to go out and get the right tool for that job. And we all select tools in our jobs. And we all suffer when our tools suffer. And sometimes when we select the wrong tool for a job, it just gets harder to do. Uh, and that has to do, it th doesn't matter whether you're talking about a physical product or something with code. So we're concerned about goals, objectives, strategies, and tactics here. And if you want the truth, what a product manager does varies incredibly by different organization and different industry category. So I can't tell you necessarily what a product manager does because it's different. At one company, they may have full financial responsibility for running spreadsheets. There are some product managers at some companies that barely know what their product does. They live inside a spreadsheet. And my entire company could be one line item on a spreadsheet to a product manager. They don't care what we do or how we do it. Just that we get it done and that it's within budget, and that's it. Other product managers are deeply into A-B split testing and the analytics and doing this and that, or the marketing side, or whatever it might be. <coughs> Sorry. So the closest we can come to this is to look at the roles and not skip too far ahead. All right. 
So one of the things any product manager should be doing is looking at the product market fit, and we're going to talk a lot about that. This is the Lean Product Playbook by a gentleman named Dan Olson. There's a target customer. You and your grandma who need a shovel, right? You have underserved needs. You need that hole someplace. Well, I have a value proposition because I make shovels. I make a lot of different kinds of shovels. Luckily, I make one that fits your needs. It has a number of different features. Maybe it's a sharp blade. Maybe it's a wide blade. Maybe it's whatever it is because maybe I'm digging dirt. Maybe I'm moving gravel. I don't know. And then there's the user interface for it. It could have a handle. It could just have a stick. It could have all kinds of different things. Right here is the product market fit, though. It's between the underserved needs of a customer and the value proposition. And this is what you're looking for. You're looking to match these two things together. I don't care how well you execute code. If it doesn't satisfy some form of underserved needs, what have you actually done? It may be elegant code. It may be beautiful but nobody's going to necessarily buy it. And that's our fault. That's product management's fault. That's what we owe developers, good strategy. All right. So developers have a, all kinds of frameworks. There's a million different kinds of frameworks in tech. Product managers have frameworks too. Here's just one of them. It's called the pragmatic framework. And we take a product where we might look at the market, and there's all these different boxes, different activities that you may perform. And it goes through the business and planning and programs and support. One person probably can't handle all of this. It might take multiple people. Or maybe one person can handle all of this for one product, but not for a product portfolio. And this is just one of many frameworks. There's dozens of them. If you're interested in product management frameworks, you know where to go. Type in product management frameworks, and you will get a whole list of them. Or come and see this presentation, and we'll try and make these links hot on the, um, on the PowerPoint so you can click on them. How do we look at the world? Well, it goes into what I was talking about earlier problem, an opportunity. And then there's the solution space. And these are very different things. Because a lot of times what we work on when we start writing code, when we start doing algorithms, when we start doing flowcharts, we're working on the solution space. How do we solve it? But are we solving the right problems? So if I look at pet owners that need pet sitters sometimes, maybe you have a dog, a cat, and you're, you're going out, you're working, there's a lot of ways I can solve that problem. I can just do a directory. I can build a peer-to-peer -peer marketplace. Or if it's business owners that need a workspace in a city, I can, I can put brokers online, I can make directories again, I can make shared workspace programs. There's a lot of different things I can do. There's a lot of ways I can solve that problem. What's the best way? <coughs> again, we're going to do a lot of that tonight, unfortunately. So there's a lot of different roles in product management, right? Product manager, like me. Product market, product owner, which is really a scrum or an agile type of term. Technical product manager, a product marketing manager, a project manager. Project is very different than product. Does anybody know the difference between product and project? Can somebody tell me? What? Okay, exactly. What, there's something else special about project, though. Projects, by definition, have what? They have a start date, and they also have an end date. Now, some people don't believe that's true. They say, well, what if I'm going on and on with this, this project that goes over and over again? Usually that's a process, not a product. Now, there could be a, a project to build a process. But the point is, look at all these different types of project product managers, okay? No wonder there's confusion as to what we do. So what do we actually do? We analyze market conditions. We look for those opportunities and challenges. A lot of times, we're not even looking at individual objects. We look at the relationships, the space between things. That's where things get really interesting. We identify something called SMART goals, hopefully, if you're doing it right. Specific targets, measurable progress, assignment of task, realistic results, and a time in which they need to be achieved, because you don't want to miss the marketplace. Yeah, we define product requirements, too. And that could be formal documents, or you could be in an agile framework. It doesn't matter. The point is, you've got to do some of the upfront work first. So a lot of times the product manager is going to be a product owner in an agile environment. Now, agile is a little bit weird because it sort of puts product and project together in an interesting way. There's pros and cons to being agile. There's good news and bad news about being agile. But a lot of times if you're a product manager in an agile environment, ideally there's two of you. One is a product manager, which is usually outward facing. I work with clients or I work with the customer or I work with whomever it is. And the product owner, which is a formal scrum role, which is internal facing and works with the internal team. 
A lot of small companies don't have that. They don't have the budget or resource for that, and there's one person doing this job. A lot of times, depending on the product, that one person cannot do both those jobs well. They're pulled in different directions. My job here, for example, is to work with a lot of external clients and bring that information back to the company. I love my team. These are great people. These are ridiculously talented developers. They're really, really smart. If I spend too much time with them, though, I might not be spending enough time with clients and understanding their real needs. Because there's hard skills with product management. When I say hard skills, I mean the, the actual doing of it. And we're going to get into some of the, the tasks are for that. But there's the soft skills of empathy, too. I need to feel their pain. I need to understand what they're going through and what their needs are. Because those are the things I have to solve. It's not about me. It's not about my company. It's about satisfying their needs. Or I lose. I lose a bid. I lose a job. Whatever it is. So our goal is really simple. We create things of value uh, that also create business value. Again, we talked about not-for-profits. Uh, I don't think product management is necessarily well understood in a lot of digital development companies, a lot of times because they don't feel they need product management at first. There's, there's two ways I think ideas really come from. One is insights and the other is research. And we all know what insights are. You're, walk you're walking around the world, something happens. Something happens where you say, you know, I wish they would make something a little better. And you say, why does this thing work like this? And one of you might be a little bit of an entrepreneur. You might say, you know what? I can build it better. That's inspiration. Okay? There's another way I can find information, though. I can actually do research. Maybe I'm a large company and I already have a lot of customers. I have people I can talk to. I can survey them. I can bring them in. I can talk to them. I can analyze their behavior. I can look at the gaps. So there's, I think that those are the two major ways w that I personally think ideas come from. Right, it comes from flashes of inspiration based on personal experience, or it comes from intentional research. Now, there's a lot of stuff in Agile, for example, where we say we're going to iterate fast and throw things in the marketplace and see what works. But does that really take you there? Where'd the idea come from? What do you do in the first place? How do you get to that point? <coughs> so here's the thing. There's user marketplace and desires, which I've talked a little bit about. You guys know about user experience. You design for it. And there's business needs. And then there's the solution space. You've probably seen this chart. If you've looked into the stuff at all, you've come across this. It's very common. You're here. You're in between user experience, business, and technology. Anytime you're looking at modern books or articles, whatever it is, they're saying there's design thinking, there's finance, there's code. We all should be up front. We should be at the beginning of the project process. Everybody wants to be in the room, okay? You have to balance everybody's thoughts and needs. But I'm going to tell you a little secret. It's actually not so much of a secret. It's the way you get things more right more of the time. And it's about all the different stakeholders. You know what stakeholders are, right? It's different people that have a stake in your project. So it could be the client, it could be the customers, it could be investors, it could be somebody else. The value of Lean and Agile, and th this, by the way, is a personal opinion, okay? I don't know if this is written out there. You can believe it or not, and you, or you can write to me and tell me, yeah, you think that's great or that's horrible. But I think something that's happened that's interesting about Agile has nothing to do with the, spe with the specific uh, methodology, whether it's Kanban or Scrum or some other form of Agile. It's that it's gotten more people in the room together. When we do stand-ups, when we bring more people together earlier in the process, there's more communication. There's more ideas in the room. This has been sort of a, a side effect of Agile. All right, but I think it's had a lot of value. I think it's brought more people together earlier. It's brought more people closer to customers earlier. And that communication stops bad things from happening sooner and sometimes allows good things to happen. Strategy. What should we be doing with strategy? Corporate strategy asks a very large question. What business should we be in at all? And digital in particular is how do we use digital technology to further our business goals? How many people have a GPS on their phone? and use it to navigate with a map. Anybody who didn't raise their hand is either just tired because it's been a long week <laughs> or is just lying. Okay, so let's say you worked for a GPS company 10 or 15 years ago. 2000, when, did the iP when did the iPhone first come out? 2008, somewhere around there? 2007, thank you. See, that's great. It's smart, informed people. I don't have to get things right. I've got all of you to correct me. There was a big GPS industry out there. Garmin, Magellan, TomTom. A lot of companies. Apple did not go out into the world to go and destroy them. 
okay? It was almost like a drive-by shooting. It was an accident. This thing destroyed a lot of value in those companies. It didn't necessarily destroy the companies. They pivoted. They went into other businesses. They did other things. But if you were a product manager at one of those GPS companies in 2007, would you have seen this coming before it launched? Would you have thought there's about to be a device in everybody's pocket? It's a, it's, it's a computer. It's also a telephone. It's a messaging thing. I, I don't quite know what it is. Steve Jobs did it, and he's bright. And what do we do? Our business value is about to be destroyed. What business do we need to go in? Would you have seen that coming? Can you look around corners like that? This is what product management is supposed to try to do, all right? And it's hard because there's a lot of things moving very fast right now. And that's just one example. Strategy versus goals. One may imply the other. A lot of times this gets very confusing. Again, depending on where you read and what you read, some might say, oh, the goal comes first. No, the strategy comes first. I'm going to say goals come first, and then you have a strategy to accomplish those goals. There's something you want to do, and then we form a strategy to go and do it. Now, that could get a little backwards depending on the hierarchical levels. I could work for a large corporation where I have a strategy for my department, and then they've got goals within them, and then there's goals. So, you know, you can take that as you will. But typically of a large scale desired result, like I want to create a great tasting health drink. And by the way, most of the examples I use are going to be physical products, not necessarily digital products, just because it's easier. But we are going to get in a couple of digital products. Um, strategy is how are you going to achieve that goal? I might market to existing category buyers as well as try and expand my market. Objective, a measurable means to achieve strategy. Measurable. Measure, KPIs, analytics. Everybody, does everybody know the difference between a metric and a KPI? A metric is just a number, it's a measurement. A KPI is a key performance indicator. It's how are you doing in business. So to me, a KPI is typically, it could be a metric, just how many pages did I get? But typically it's a ratio of some kind or change over time. It's a percentage increase or decrease. It's, it's not just a snapshot, it's how am I actually doing? Uh, and then, so I want to build things. I want to make sure they're instrumented for analytics. Because uh, Peter Drucker, great management guru, said, if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. So I need actionable insights. Actionable. Meaning I want to measure things that I can actually do something different with if I know about it. And lastly, my tactics. These are specific tools and techniques to achieve strategic objectives. This is where most of us live most of the time, way down here. But these things better be right. And we'll talk more about why. <coughs> already talked about this. Lean alone might not take you there. I've stood up products like Jira or Lean Management. I've, I've worked for a bunch of different companies, both as an employee or a startup co-founder um, or as a consultant. All right, so I've, I've had the benefit of, of being involved with a lot of different companies, as have many of you if you've done development um, as a contractor. What's interesting about, oh, there's the GPS example, so sorry if I skipped ahead with that. Um, sometimes, one of the things that happens with Lean and Agile is we're so focused on, on this sprint or next sprint or let's get this out and do that, we, loo we lose sight of the big picture. Right? Are we actually producing something of value? Motion does not equal progress. I can run in place and maybe that's good for me for exercise. Okay? But it's not good for me if I'm trying to actually go someplace. All right? So we need strategy. We need, to, we need to have a purpose. We want to become the high quality leader in order to what? In order to capture what percent of a marketplace. I want to improve the customer experience because if I do that, they'll feel less pain. They'll give me more money. I can pay my mortgage. Things are good. Mortgage, you know, for my house or whatever. Uh, some of these things can sort of seem like goals and objective. You decide where they fit in the hierarchy. Everybody know this story? The blind man, the elephant? This guy? grabs the tusk. Well, this is a spear. This guy grabs the trunk. It's a giant tube. That guy grabs a leg. This is a, a pillar or a post or something. This guy grabs the tail. Well, it's a rope. What's the point? How we perceive something very much depends on the lens through which we're looking. All right? How we choose to look at something circumscribes what it is we can know. When we choose our measuring tool, that limits what we can understand. All right? If I choose <coughs> if I choose a ruler that's in metric, 
I'm going to get millimeters, centimeters, whatever. If I choose an English reader um, ruler, I'm going to get something else. I may be the able to estimate. Like I might know uh, what's what's an inch, 2.5, 2.54 2 centimeters, something like that. I might be able to guesstimate, guesstimate, but my tool does not allow me the precision I need. If I use a telescope, I'm going to see something very different than binoculars. Well, this has impact on product management as well. There's many different frameworks we can use to look at our world. We can use something called Porter's Five Forces, the value net, SWOT, PESTEL, BCG, business model canvas. If you, does anybody know about, have you guys heard about these things already? All right, we're not gonna go through all of them. The marketing guy has, all right. We're not gonna go through all of them. I'm just gonna give you a survey of a couple of them. How you might behave in the marketplace as a company might be informed by where you sit along these different axes, okay? For any industry, and you can pick a company within an industry, and you can say, what's happening in this industry? What are the barriers to entry? Right. Amazon Web Services. There's big barriers to entry there, right? Multi-billion dollar data centers. I want to get into the cloud services business. You're going to compete with Google and Microsoft and Amazon? Okay, that's a barrier. Needing billions of dollars, that's a barrier. All right. What about supplier power? What if there's only a few suppliers in an industry? They're going to be able to dictate pricing. Threat of substitutes. Are there other things I can use? We talked about the screwdrivers before, right? I can use a screwdriver to drive a nail, but it's not a good idea. Chances are I should use a hammer. But sometimes I can substitute other products for things. Buyer power and the competitive rivalry within an industry. If there's an intense competitive rivalry here, you're increasingly in a commodity business. Your profit margins are going to be low. Is that a business you want to be in? Maybe, maybe not. Porter's five forces. SWAT, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, threats. This is a classic strategy tool. For any company, I can look at my strengths, and these are typically an internal focus at my company. What's my brand value? What's my patent portfolio? Do I have a large customer base? I can have weaknesses. I might be a high cost producer. I might be slow to innovate. When I look outside, I've got opportunities and threats. There are developing markets, and there's a new product pipeline. I'm 3M Corporation, Minnesota Mining and whatever. The people that make the sticky notes, right? They've got, they've got a lot of stuff in their patent pipeline. Something like 50% of their profits come from products that have been developed in the past five years, something like that. That statistic is wrong, but it, it's something on that order of magnitude. Threats. There's new, there's new people entering my business. I don't have protectable intellectual property. I don't have patents. Other people can enter my, enter my realm. So this is a large scale look. This is PESTEL. I'm gonna leave SWAT behind for a moment. That, by the way, that 30 second description of that doesn't do it justice. Nothing I'm saying here does, by the way. If you're interested in this sort of thing, get the presentation, go dig in more. Pestle. This is a large scale look at businesses. It's, it's, it's political, economic, social, technical, legal, and environment. Remember what I said about lenses, different ways to look at the world. These are different tools. I like to use all of them, not just one, because it gives me a more holistic view of what's going on. Let's go back to SWAT for a second. How do I fill this out? I could sit around in a room with a bunch of people and we could come up with ideas. Good for us, we're smart, we'd come up with some stuff. But if I take PESTEL and I say, okay, political, economic, social, technological, legal environment, I can go back here and say, I've got some threats in the political environment. My industry is about to be regulated. Social, there's something going on in my industry that's gonna be good and that's an opportunity. Legal, you know. So I can use the other models to inform different models, it can help me flesh out my ideas. If what? If I look through different lenses, if I look at the world in different ways. Because it's hard. Because all of us have our different perspectives and we all have our prejudices. By using these tools, it helps us step out of ourselves a little bit and not be so selfish, not, not be so narrow-minded in our day-to-day. -day. Again, political, economic, social, technical, legal, environmental. Each one of these things has a whole bunch of other stuff behind it. And if you look at what some of these things are, you can identify some of these strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. Let's try one, just for fun. I did, the, by the way, again, this is just me. This could be wrong. I slapped this together. This is for Airbnb. Political, they're affected by local laws and taxes. Economic, they could get new competitors, increased housing demand. By the way, I'm sorry, um, green is favorable, brown could go either way, red's bad. Social. Well, they got trust in the marketplace because there's a reputation service, but they could have bad hosts. They could have violent crime. The media treatment could go either way, depending on the day. 
Anyway, there's some other stuff in here, but we're going to move on because you can read this online. We can have strategic roadmaps, just like we have product roadmaps. Here's a strategic mode map, and it's sort of violating some of the Scrum principles, right? Because why? Because I put dates on it. You can't do that. You can't be agile and have dates. But I need some sense of where I'm going and when I need to get there. Right? So for I can also do different swim lanes here. Like in JIRA, the swim lanes might be vertical, but here they're horizontal. Business, my partners, uh, and consumer products. So I know over the next year or so, I need to do certain things. I need to redesign for mobile somewhere around June. I need to build some APIs for partners. And th these are different things I need to do. This is my strategic roadmap, things I think I need to do in the marketplace to be able to compete. And then there's a pivot. You guys heard of pivot? Some of you? All right. This is simple. It's a change in goal or strategy and direction. But really what happens when you pivoted, it's because you were failing. You missed that product market fit. Okay? It's not working out. And it, we'll talk about that in another presentation later. Why do you have to pivot? Maybe your original product thesis was just wrong. Or maybe you can't get over certain technical hurdles. Could be you're too far ahead of the marketplace. It doesn't matter why. You got to do something else. It's not working. No one cares. No one's buying. And you better do it before you run out of cash. So as a product manager, you should know what's going on. And you should be looking at the numbers. So if you're not keeping track of numbers, if you're not keeping track of how your product is doing in the marketplace, then I'm going to go really far here. I'm going to say something. I'm going to say, I think you're being negligent. I think you're being negligent in your job. You deserve to be fired, okay? Because there's a lot of people that are depending on you. And what I mean by that is, who, again, who, developers here, when you guys make a mistake, well, that's not good. Code got wherever. It's going to hurt the product, all right? It may, may even cost a couple dollars, and that's unfortunate, and that's sad. Maybe a project is a little bit late. People are upset with you. But you can get past that. Tactical execution failures are surmountable. Now, if the mistake was such that something bad happened and a competitor did something before you, you know what? You were in such incredible competition, you had problems in your industry anyway. All right? That's what happens when a developer makes a mistake. When a product manager makes a strategic mistake, game over. Your, your, your company could just be out of business or your division could be out of business. Best case, you're out of a job. Okay? Because it's not the developer's fault, all right? They executed beautiful, elegant, wonderful code, but you told them to do the wrong thing. So what did you really do? You wasted their resources. You wasted their time. Let's say you work for a company, and, you know, everybody's getting paid, and that's how we pay for our houses, our food, and everything else. But you made a bad decision. You let your whole team down, all right? Because you made a strategically bad decision. That's a bad failure. Don't do it. Now, there's one exception to that. If it's a startup and it's just an investment, everybody gets that it's just a wild, crazy investment, and everybody gets on board knowing that risk. That's okay. Marketing, how are we doing on time? I think I'm going too slow. All right. Marketing competitive analysis, defining your market position. Oops. Everybody wants what you want. Everybody. They want your lunch. They want to eat your lunch. They want to kick your teeth in. And it depends on the marketplace. It depends on how competitive it is and how crazy it is. But chances are, if somebody sees you doing something and it's successful, everybody wants a piece. And if you don't have patents, if you don't have protectable intellectual property, you better be first to market or a fast second. And you better get a lot of market share first. Or somebody else is just going to take you out just like that. So what do we do about that? <coughs> this is why we do market analysis, because we want to see where we fit. Because if you don't have a market, you don't have anything else. If there's nobody who cares about what you're doing, there's no point in doing what you're doing. You can be spending a lot of time, a lot of money, a lot of effort for what? To come up with a beautiful product that doesn't work? I've done that. Later on, I'm going to show you an example. And it sucks. Okay? These are market map examples. <coughs> there's a lot of them. There's a friend of mine who called these calls these logo soup, right? Because it's just a bunch of logos sitting here. Let me, sorry, let me get this right. How's that? Okay, better. So you've got all these logos, logos here. And what's interesting about these market maps isn't so much all the logos. It's how different, to me anyway, how people categorize them. So whoever made this map didn't just throw some logos out there. They made an attempt to categorize the different spaces. 
and that helps you because it helps you know who's your, who, who are your competitors, where do you fit, who else might you be looking to to compete with. <coughs> so what are the adjacencies in the market? And that means people who are next to you product-wise. Might there be partnerships that you hadn't considered? I'm going to try putting this thing around my neck so it doesn't so it doesn't so it doesn't move as much so it doesn't move as much move as much move as much maybe I'll just hold it or maybe I'll get a microphone in a second you know what give me one of the mics more volume too much volume how's that better okay thank you all right so are there partnerships you might not have considered. This is exciting, huh? All right. So there's templates. There's templates for everything. There's, there's frameworks for everything. And you can go and find these and use these. You don't necessarily have to reinvent the wheel. There's the competitor array, brand positioning maps, and spot pestle and so on. Here's an example of one on a dieting focus. And hold on, let's get this right. Let me, tr let me try and put this back. <coughs> try it again, Dima. All right, I'm going to... I'm going to try and leave this thing here. It was working before, before I messed around with it. All right. Okay. Sorry, guys. So this is one I did. And again, I just made this up for one particular product just to have an example. These are different dieting apps. And I can draw these continuum. I can draw these lines, these axes, X and Y, any way I want. So I said, okay, let me, looking at the marketplace, there's some people who care more about dieting. Cause like me, I'm fat, right? I need to lose some weight. Medical health, nutrition focus, I obviously don't care about that, right? And then there's quality, and that can be subjective. I can decide what the quality is. So I plot these, and I think, and I look, where's there a gap? Well, we don't really care about being low quality and not useful for anything. But is there something over here? Maybe there's something here. Maybe there's something in this sector here. I've got the little thing here. I can use the laser, right? Maybe there's something high-end here, maybe something specific for diabetics alone, where I can beat these guys because they're all over the place. They're trying to be everything to all people, but I can do something very special here, and maybe I can charge more for it. Maybe that's a gap in the marketplace I can exploit. I don't know. But by doing this market map, I might be able to find that gap, okay? Now, over here, <coughs> this is called a radar chart or a spider chart, whatever you want to call it. This is for cell phone manufacturers, and again, this data is probably wrong. I didn't use data for this. I made it up. So just, you know, take that, take that to heart. Oops. All right. Correct button. So here's a plot of the different attributes of some of the top cell phones. And I can also look for gaps here. Is there something going on in this marketplace that's surprising? This is all pretty well known here. You know, Apple's the high price leader quality and they, they get to do all these things. So there's no surprises here. I don't think I learned much from this, but I might have. It depends on the market. I've got to go through the exercise to find out. Turned out this might be a waste of your time, but maybe not. It doesn't take long to do. That might not be true, by the way. It might take a long time to gather the data. So. You have to make these decisions because you've only got so much time, just like everything else. Which tools are you going to use? The point is, without an understanding of your marketplace ecosystem, you're going to miss large-scale trends. You're going to hear about it from somebody else, and it's going to be too late. Right? You need to be looking around the corners in as much as you can. You're going to fail. It's hard. Other people, somebody down the street is working on something in his garage that's brilliant. All right? You don't know about it. There's no way you could know about it. Cryptocurrencies is a good example. The world is waking up to that in some ways. And it, it may be good, it may be bad, whatever it is. But all the big money's been made. Who here wants to get into crypto mining now? Who here wants to be a cypherpunk at this point? Not me. The big money's you have to have a billion dollar server farm in China to compete with those miners. It's too late. It's too late. But by understanding your marketplace, you can feel trends. You can see them, but you, you can ideate them, get an idea. You can, you can, you can feel them. And when I say you can feel them, sometimes we do things intellectually, like we understand them and we can track them, but other times you can get a sense of things. You guys all know the word intuition. It's a sense of things. I get a feeling about something. Well, where does intuition come from? Right? Are we just born with something about a marketplace intuition? I don't think so. It's our experience. That's why when we hire people and we look at resumes and we look at experiences and things like that, what are we really doing when we say we want experience? 
yeah, it's specific knowledge. But I got news for you. The developers, any one of you smart people, I could take you and probably switch your framework. And you're going to need to learn new syntax, but you'll be able to do that next thing. Th it doesn't matter which thing I make you do. But if you've got more experience, you're going to have more intuition. You're going to have more sense of different algorithms and different things and how they work. And it's not going to matter what language you work in. You're going to have a sense of what's going on. Well, the same is true for marketplaces. And this is why, you know, if somebody's been working in banking for 50 years, maybe they got a lot of value in banking. They might have value in other industries as well. But, th but the point is you can, get, you can get some intuition from these different tools. What about knowing your customer, user personas and customer journey? Who are your customers? What paths do they take when they engage with your business? And we've got tools like user personas. This guy, Scott Smith, is a do-it-yourself woodworking novice. Because the thing is, I work for a company that sells online woodworker training videos. I need to know how to reach this person. How do I reach them? Well, you market to them. I'm going to go out and I'm just going to buy advertising. Where? Well, woodworking magazine, stuff like that. Of course, these things are obvious. But is there something else about this guy on his journey? Who is he? Remember, a persona isn't a particular person. It's sort of a proxy statement for everybody else, for the, for the whole cohort. So this is a made up thing. So he's 57 years old. He's a chemical engineer. He's got a couple kids in college. Here's his quote. I love building my own pieces, but I'm still learning. What is he motivated by? Here's his motivation and his goals. Why do we care? Well, because this informs some of how we might send our messaging to him. We want to know how to reach him along different points in his user journey. But we also know, need to know how to talk to him. What tone of voice? What type of colors? What size font? Look, 57. So let's say the cohort is actually age 45 to 60. You're going to do some really cool flat design with tiny little fonts in different colors? You better not, because he's got some degree of eyesight difficulty. All right. So you better use nice large fonts in traditional colors with high contrast. And you better through a throw it through a contrast checker to check there too. Now how could you do that? Because you know your creative brief as product manager to your creative team is to make sure to satisfy this guy's needs. Now some believe them they're a waste of time. Lean cultures just want to go fast and use empirical data and that's fine. There isn't a lot of hard data that justifies the use of, of user personas and some think they're just too abstract. So there's negatives to them too. But then we come to customer journey maps. And these are things that show how a customer travels on their path in deciding on a purchase of a product and after the product and for support and things like that. Well, how do we form a customer journey map if we don't know who our customer is? And I'll, I'm going to, since Dima's over here, I'm going to wander over here for a second just to, so I can say hi to the people over there. Hi, people in the corner. I didn't think you can see you there. Uh, these are all over the place. As I said, there's tool sets for a lot of these things. But you know what? The tool sets for these aren't very good. There's a few. I think AHA, which is product management, Smaply. I, I'm not sure if Smaply has one. But there's a few places where you can start to build these. But really, of course, you can just use PowerPoint or whatever it is anyway. Uh, <coughs> these are all over the place. But you're looking for the Zmots. Go get this document from Google. Zmot is zero moment of truth. These are the moments when I'm changing paths, when I'm making decisions. Those are the moments where I'm going to decide to buy or to not buy or to use that other product or to do whatever it is I'm going to do. You're looking for the nudge opportunities. Now, nudge is a specific word, all right? And I think, I'm not sure if nudge is from gamification theory or um, social behavioral analysis, but the idea here is you don't get to just make somebody do something, okay? But you can push them just a little bit in a certain direction. Remember, my belief about marketing is, is never lie. Never be disingenuous. Well, you, you are spinning. You're presenting your product in the best light. All right. The danger of the skills that we have now with gamification and marketing, I think there's also an ethical question here in terms of, of what sorts of things you do in the world. Because you can trick people into doing things they don't necessarily want to. And that's not good. Because, by the way, at the back side of that, they're going to complain about you anyway, and you're going to pay for that later one way or the other. But you're looking for the nudge opportunities in terms of marketing and what you might put. And this might affect your UI, your UX, as well as your marketing. Uh, you guys know about Diffusion of Innovations? This is from, who is this, Clay Christensen? I, I'm, I'm going to get the name wrong. I'll have to look it up for you. But innovations, new things, which a lot of us have the privilege of working on, end up in the marketplace in a very predictable way. 
we have the early adopters, the, or the innovators, and then the early adopters, the early majority, the late majority, and the laggards. A lot of people in this room, I'll bet you, are innovators. You're the first to have something. At worst, you're the early adopters. No one in this room is a laggard. I would bet no one in this room is a late majority, okay? And that's partly because of age, it's partly because of mindset. But guess what? You may be designing or developing for products late in their life cycle, which is for these people. All right? So what I'm saying to you here is your outlook might be wrong. Your perspective might be wrong. And that gets back to that whole idea of empathy. You need to enter, I think anyway, empathetically into a relationship with your customer and try and see things from their point of view. Because you're trying to provide value to them, not to you. It's not look what I did, not look what I made. Did this have value for my target customer? And that's what product managers are really seeking. That's our goal. So in this business, let's say you're trying to do these things and you're, you're the customer. Like right now, I speak to you as somebody who works for a development company, all right? But I've played a lot of different roles. I've worked on both sides of this. I've worked for dev companies and I've worked for on the client side and, and whatever. On the client side, they have the theories of constraints, and that's you have uh, resources, time, and um, uh, quality. And there's, a, there's a few different dimensions you could look at there. And you can pick any two, all right? Like I can, I can buy time with money to a degree, all right? I can't always make things faster. Throwing more people as a pro at a project doesn't necessarily make it faster. But I might want to decide to buy or rent e-commerce software for something like goods I'm selling. I'm not going to design and build my own e-commerce platform just to sell a few items. But then again, maybe I work for Shopify. Maybe my business is designing and developing e-commerce software. So you have to make a decision whether you're going to buy, build, or, or rent. This book, that book, this book now, I'm going to stop using the stupid pointer thing. It's fun for me, but I keep hitting the wrong button. The Nature of the Firm, uh, very old book. And by the way, a lot of these concepts I'm telling you about here are very old. They're decades old, but they're perfectly applicable to today. In fact, they're even more applicable today because a lot of people don't know about them. They forgot, and now we're learning about them again. How many people here ever use a paper clip? No one? Just one person uses paper clips, too? Everybody's completely online. You've gotten really good. You're very green. You're very sustainable. It's very earth-friendly. I think you're just tired, too tired to raise your arms. But you probably used a paper clip. At your company, you probably have paper clips, even though you're mostly using computers. Did your company design and build its own paper clips? Probably not. Why? Because it's a million dollars to buy that extrusion tool for the aluminum and pull out the wires and fold them all. I'd rather go down to the store and for, you know, 50 cents or $2 or whatever, buy a thousand paper clips. Because there's a transaction cost to this. And that's what this idea is here. Um, hold on. Transaction costs are any costs associated with participating in a market. And that includes searching for the information in the first place and trying to negotiate for things and then policing and enforcement. I'm not going to build, I'm not going to make my own paper clips. The same as a large company might say, I've got an internal IT staff and they're really good, but I'm not going to try and make them do machine learning for a particular project. Why? Number one, I only need them for a short time. Number two, guess what? I think there's 16,000 job openings right now for something with the word data scientist in it. Most of them probably aren't really for data science. And there's something like 3,000. The point is the demand is too high. We don't have it. So you're going to go out and buy it. So you might not need to bring that talent in-house, in or you might not be able to afford it. The transaction costs are doing it just don't make sense for you. And it's not your core business anyway. It's not what you're trying to do. It's just a tool. By the way, this is one of the things that product managers have to help decide. And this is, these are the ones a lot of times that have P&L, profit and loss responsibility, that are looking at the math of the, um, of the profitability. So how do you decide this? Are you going into a new market? What's your go-to-market timing? I can buy speed by going external sometimes, unless it's a failed project, in which case it's worse. That's all other story. What kind of team do you need? Maybe you don't have the infrastructure to support your goals. And a lot of our clients in the, in the development shop industry don't. Obviously, we're working with tons of clients who just can't begin to think about what it might be to run a technical department. What's the final 
cost-benefit analysis for each option. People tend to underestimate costs, right? If you, I've, I've helped build five different startups. It's always, always higher than people think, always, always. We always underestimate costs. You take whatever you think they are and just double it and then double it again. So why would we outsource? I already talked a little bit about this. Maybe the products or services aren't strategic to the firm. The fixed costs are undesirable and so on and so forth. And again, I'm sorry if I went too fast there, but all this stuff's going to be online. Stakeholder management. Here's another part of product management. When you get past all the hard stuff, what do we do in the first place? You got to manage all the people involved. All right. You sit here, you got owners, customers, government, employees, suppliers, lenders, the whole community and society in general. These are all things you have to be aware of. You know, today I was dealing with something where um, there, there was, uh, in one day, like multiple aspects of the product happened at the same time. There were some technical needs, there were some product needs, and some legal needs. And there was potentially some protectable intellectual property. So there's potentially something for a patent. Now, all of a sudden, if there's protectable IP, I got to be careful. I can't necessarily tell everybody about that. Otherwise, it's out and I can no longer file. So I have to pay attention to all that. You should map out your stakeholders to determine what their influence might be on your efforts. What are their expectations and are they important? You need a communications and engagement strategy for them. Why? Because they affect you in different ways. And again, this is the product manager's responsibility to developers. If we don't get this right, all of your wonderful effort might come out to not be worth as much, and that's not fair to you. So we have to get this right, because right? I've got different types of stakeholders. Some I just need to keep satisfied. Some are key players. Some I just need to tell them what's going on, and others I need minimal effort. Let me give you an example of that. So this is Uber. Once again, just made this up. Not sure if it's right. Just threw some stuff in there. We could discuss it for hours if you wanted to. I don't think you want to, though, because there's cookies later. There's a level of interest along the x-axis and power along the y-axis. Regulators. I mean, we all know Uber's suffering in some ways for different reasons because their CEO is a whatever. It's not important. Let's pretend he wasn't part of the factor, part of the picture here. Regulators, you better keep satisfied because they're very powerful. They don't have a high level of interest. They sort of do, but they're just kind of doing their job. Just keep them happy and you're fine. Drivers and riders are key players. All right. High level of interest, high power. I better have a communication strategy that engages with them. Um, I was going to say as frequently as possible, but that's wrong. I don't know if it's as frequently as possible or as effectively as possible. I better know what my needs are. I just know they're important. Competitors, yeah, I sort of got to pay attention, but I'm focused on my product, not so much my competitors. The media, yeah, it could be pro or con. Shareholders, I need to keep their informed, and they're very interested. But they might not be all that powerful. It depends. <coughs> so, keeping going forward further with Uber, what might we do? What did we use? Why did we make the chart? What did we use it for? Dima, you can see there, okay? Right. You know, I can, I can block you, right? Yeah, I'll show you later. Uh, so our users, we have contact lists for them because we have a list of these people, right? So they have high influence. They can be viral. They can send our message around. What's the hindrance they provide? Their bad experiences are shared. That hurts us. So what's our communication strategy? We need to use earned, owned, and paid media, and we need to continue to message the value. And I could go through the whole chart, but I won't. Again, it'll be online. The idea here is all of these different stakeholders we, we reach in different ways. They have different kinds of influence. They can help us in various ways. They can hurt us in various ways. We should understand what these things are, and we should address them accordingly. So we need a communication strategy for this. This might be something, you know, and now we know we need one of these tools. Somebody needs to invent one for somebody who's got big fat thumbs and can't work them right. So somebody go and invent that. The point is here, this might be the job of a product marketing manager, but in a smaller company, you might just be the one person. So you have to do this too. Or maybe you don't have time to do this. And maybe you don't do this. And maybe that ends up not mattering at all. Maybe it doesn't matter. Or maybe it kills your company dead. Right? That's part of the problem. It's hard to know what's important to do. So you need to have sort of a sense, that intuition, of where should I be spending my time? If you're in a hot environment where you, where you know for certain 
that you've got people at high risk or something like that. You better do this. You better be ready for it. Product life cycle management. Introduction, growth, maturity, decline. Products have a life cycle. Products have a life cycle. Thank you. So we go from introduction to growth, ideally. Or you, you could die anywhere along here, by the way. You're hit by a car, whatever. But you introduce your product, you grow, you mature, and then there's a decline. This is natural. Look at just about any product. There's several models that go into various types of complexity here. Where your products are in this life cycle can very much determine, I'm sorry, Dean, I'll, I'll go over here now. Get my face over here. Well, I went there to see the nice people in the corner because I couldn't see them from it. So at different stages, there are going to be different things you're going to do. There's a lot of different models for this. Remember, again, models, frameworks, everybody's got one. Everybody's got a favorite. You need to look for the one that's appropriate for your industry category. <coughs> Here's an example. We've got sales going up and time. So at the introductory level, we've got things like autonomous cars. We have augmented reality, virtual reality. Sales are low. There's low rivalry. There's a lot of opportunity here, but also a lot of risk. We go up the chart. You can see it for yourself if you can see it. So, so up here, we have really strong rivalry. And at the end, we have extreme rivalry where we've got low sales and the costs are also low. Why are the costs low? It's a mature industry. We've grown. We've gotten to be more efficient producers, okay? And that's when we extend our products a little bit. How many people here have a DVR player? You play discs. No one has DVR players? Some of you haven't even So you have a red shovel and a DVR player. All right, but nobody else has these things. All right. That may or may not be true. I don't believe some of you, but, but here's the point. If you remember when DVRs and laser discs came out, all the rest of that sort of stuff, there was, a, there was a conflict between two different formats for it. That was probably the last conflict over a format for a physical media we will ever see, okay? Because we plug in now, everything's connected. New computers don't even come with, they certainly don't come with disk drives. They, 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 don't, they don't come with CD-ROMs, they don't come with DVRs. Maybe they come with DVRs, it depends, all right? Decline. If you were a CD manufacturer stamping those things out, did you see this coming? Did you take all the money you had made for decades making those discs, if you were the owner, if you were an investor, and put it into something else, maybe into networking, which were the things that were replacing you? If you didn't, you, you maybe you stopped advertising. You just said, I'm going to wind down this business. I'm going to treat it as a cash cow, which is a legitimate thing to do, <coughs> to just say, look, this is over. Customer lifecycle management, which is different than product lifecycle management. And again, I say to you, I'm... That last slide, those last two slides, should be a 10-hour course all on their own, okay? And I gave them like three PowerPoint slides, all right? So I'm, I'm doing a gross disservice to every single one of these ideas here. So, so there's something here, again, that, that speaks to you that you think you might need for your product or for your company. Get the presentation, use the keywords to search, and you'll find plenty. What is customer lifecycle management? It's the understanding of the evolutionary stages of the customer as distinct from the product. We acquire customers. I'm going to try it one more time. Acquire, they grow, we manage, and we reclaim them. What does that mean? It means we might have lost them, but we can get them back. Remember, it, sometimes it's very expensive to get a customer usually. Depending on your industry, it can be $10, $40, whatever. But we don't want to spend too much. How much do we spend to get a customer? Well, we better not spend more than their lifetime value to us. Otherwise, we're not profitable as a business. So most relationships have a really great start, right? Everybody's happy. And, you know, you could have a few problems, maybe. Maybe your problems get really bad. And sadly, maybe it comes to an end. Or we could get this. We could live happily ever after. It depends on you. Why do we bother looking at cu customer lifecycle management? As I said, it's about making sure that you understand the full value of the net profit you can experience from a customer over the course of the entire relationship with the customer. Because if you haven't done that, you're spending too much money, you're not going to be profitable. Maybe if you're a super hot startup with a whole lot of investment capital, you can burn that kind of cash. But you know what? You might not have a profitable business. 
Now again, for some stuff, for, <coughs> for the hot startups, for the hot VCs that don't really know what the exit looks like, maybe it's okay. They understand they're taking that risk. They're already filthy rich anyway, okay? So they're just playing around. But your responsibility is to try and get the profitability. So here's an example. For digital products that are in their mid-product lifespan, all right, it's somewhere on that maturity curve on that last slide, people might need training and documentation, account support, and technical support. For physical products, they might need things like repair, parts, and service, and things of that nature that they wouldn't have needed at the beginning. What's a good CLM model? There's a lot of models for this, and the math is, is very different depending on how much you want to put into it. Uh, again, we're going to try to acquire and activate the customer, right? We could get a customer, and by the way, this is key here, right? We do this all the time. You do a mobile app, somebody downloads it. How many people use it? How many people delete it? Activation is key. Oh, I got this many downloads. I looked on, on Firebase and App Annie and looked like, but how many people engaged? How many people came back? How many people continue to engage? Can I manage them? Can I retain them? Can I grow them? Well, I churn when they leave. It's very sad. Sad. I lost my customer. Right? Maybe I can reclaim them. So product vision and definition. There are tangible aspects of your product and there's intangible aspects of your product and they all matter. You guys, uh, have you ever eaten something and for some reason something smelled bad at the same time? Smell affects taste, right? Intangible product attributes affect tangible. Somebody did some research once and they put up uh, some search results and they made it look like Google and then they made it look like Bing. Same results, different groups. Google was rated higher. Same results, okay? And they mixed this around. People came to expect that Google was going to be right to the point where they expected it to be right before they even got there. Then they tried something different. They put up worse results. You know, they, they, they figured out what was better and what, what was worse. The Google results were still trusted more. To a certain point, right? The point is, this matters. Your brand, your quality, your style, your experience. As much as the features, the accessories, and things like that. So, to make an even larger point, everything matters now, okay? The features, the functions, the benefits, the design, the way it looks, the way it feels, my touch points with it. Every time they touch your brand, every time they hit a button on something. If I can't use a mobile app with my thumb in a certain way, I'm annoyed with you, okay? That's just another feeling, and we'll get into branding in a minute. <coughs> What's the future look like as part of your responsibility, and within what time frame? What does right now look like? You don't necessarily have to know how you're going to get there, but you have to understand where you want to go, and your vision is going to inform that product strategy. People can argue the specific order. doesn't matter. These are the steps. Change them. Do them however you want. What does the future look like? What are you trying to accomplish? What are your goals and objectives? What specific actions do you need to create desired reality? I know. You're busy. It's sprint number 48 and, and backlog item 11406 has a problem and you're working with this customer today and, and the A-B split test didn't work out and somebody didn't put the, the widget where it was supposed to be, and there's another bug here or there. I know you got to get that done. I know you got to work with your team to do that. But you got to allocate some time to do these things. Because otherwise, you're wandering along one day, and somebody comes up with something like this, and you're dead. And it's over for you. All right? Now, if you catch it early enough, maybe you still have time to respond if you're looking around. So this continuum can exist. This, this line at multiple levels, the company, the division, a program, or a product. And if you're a small company doing this yourself, it's you. But if you're working with clients, again, you need to feel their pain. You need to speak their language, too, because this is how they're thinking. They're scared all the time, and for good reason. Who's your target customer? What do they need? Not, not what do you want to make? What do they actually need? What's the product category? Key benefits? Why should they care? You're always answering that question. All of this stuff, everything I've told you, doesn't matter. I think there's a slide somewhere in here that talks about it. All that matters is, is if you can answer the question for your target customer, why should they care about what you're producing? And why should they care enough to pay you what you're trying to charge for it? Do you have competitors or substitutes? We talked about that. Why are we different? Vision statements, I think these things matter. Some people don't care. All right. I think we need to know what we're doing. Again, this is something I just made up. Synthetic vision for aviation. 
All right, they're just, again, I just made this up for fun. We're going to help commercial and private aviators vis visualize their environment to enhance safe completion of flights, enable flights not otherwise possible in low visibility flight environments. That's an example of a vision statement. What do we want to be? What do we want to be when we grow up? What's our mission? We're going to create technology to produce synthetic vision. What are we going to do? Usable by both pilots and other machine-based automated flight systems. So we have our philosophy here. We know, we know generally what it is we want to accomplish in the world. And here's how we're going to do it. And some people reverse those, by the way. Again, that's one of those things, mission, vision. You go, go online and look them up. And, and you look at 100 different sites, they're going to reverse which thing is mission and which thing is vision. So it doesn't matter. Just have them. Then you're going to form a strategy. <coughs> and again, I'm not going to read all of these things. Here. But based on your mission and your vision, you're going to say, OK, how do I get there? And that's going to form your tactics. What specific things might you do? And this gets us back to the proverbial market fit. So I talked a lot about this. If, if nobody really wants your stuff, it's, it's a sort of a nice way of saying no one cared. Just no one cared what you did. And that, that's sad. It hurts your feelings. Okay? You want to be happy, so don't let that happen. There was no whiff em again. It's pronounced whiff em. What's in it for me? You always have to answer that question. What's in it for me? How many of you guys took a shower this morning? See, now I know you're just tired. Hopefully, it's, I, I knew something smelled you. Where do you guys think about things? Like I, I sometimes take a shower and it'll be hot. And I'll, I'll, that's where I get some of my ideas and stuff. Maybe for you, it's commuting to work. Maybe it's driving. I, I don't know. But you have these sort of ideas in your head. What are you thinking about? Chances are you're thinking about your own needs for the day. And I'm not saying you're selfish, but you're thinking about, oh, I got to pick up my kid. I got to do this and that. I, I'm, I, my boss is annoyed with me today because I did this or because they're a jerk. Or because you're thinking about all these different things, but you're not thinking about what that other person needs. You might. I mean, you might be thinking about your kid or, or a relative or somebody who's sick. I, I don't know. But here, you need to think about, again, entering empathetically insofar as possible into a relationship with your customer so you can feel or understand their pain. And if you can't do that on the soft side, use data. Just watch how they behave. Right? So even if you're cold and heartless and mean, you can still use data to understand the needs of other people because you better satisfy those needs. Or again, you're out of business. Once again, you need to be figuring out what the problem space is. All right? I can't transfer large files via email. OK, solution space. Dropbox box and so on, all right? They, they, they felt this pain and they went and they did something about it. By the way, some of these products, if you think about them, whenever they came out, there was nothing technologically from stopping some of these companies from doing what they did earlier that nobody did because nobody got the sense of feeling enough pain, all right? That could have been anybody's market earlier. Heard me say it repeatedly, I'll say it again. I'll say it over and over and over again. Because if there's one thing you take out of this, if you didn't have it already, it's this. The only thing that matters is if there's a market for your product. Everything else is just everything else. 15? Okay. Road mapping, feature prioritization. The feature roadmaps are high level depictions of products or services that we build over time. Again, you, you probably know what these are because you see these all these time. You see these all the time. This is flexible. This isn't a backlog. Okay, this is even before the backlog. This is, you know, you can work with your whole team on it. But this is just my general ideas on what sort of things. It, it's kind of like the other chart we saw, a strategy chart, but it's more at the feature level. And you can do this in certain tools that, that talk directly to other agile tools. So there are product management tools out there that you can use to do strategy and product road mapping. They'll turn those into stories and bring you right down into Jira or other tools like that. So it's a continuous flow the customer from the outside in. So we use that for planning. OK, we covered that. Online business, what are you? Software development. I talked a lot about physical products because they're just easier to come up with examples sometimes. And I don't like to necessarily pick on uh, a lot of people online because maybe I want to work there one day. And then they'll go see my presentation and say, I can't hire that guy. Look what he said about us. You know. So we've got SaaS, software as a service. We've got PaaS, platform as a service. We've got IIS, um, infrastructure as a service. There's DAS, data as a service. Or what's the other thing for DAS? It's documents as a service. There's a lot of ass out there. What did I say? There's a lot of AAS out there, OK? So 
the cloud computing stack looks kind of like that. What do we do about product management in these kind of kinds of environments? It's actually harder. It's harder in some ways because you have more stakeholders, which means more personas and more user journeys. So whether you're developing products for these people or you're selling into these people, you got more different people to deal with. I got news for you. You can have some, how many people have know what procurement departments are at large corporations? Do you know what those are? It's the people who control the purse strings. You could have a marketing development manager or somebody in tech, a developer, CTO, who loves your product, who wants your product. They want it so bad, they want to they want to sign an SOW with you tomorrow. There's just one problem. Finance is increasingly powerful. And there's somebody in the procurement department that's got to put a stamp on that. Guess what? That's your problem, OK? Because you've got to help. Not only do you have to come up with the right product and do the right messaging and get to your target customer, now you have to help your target customer get their way through their corporation to even buy your product, all right? So sometimes your messaging has to account for that too. Uh, okay, next, legal. This is legal, I think this is legal. Lawyers can, t uh, lawyers can just screw up a sunny day. And everybody likes to bash on lawyers, um, and I do too. And there's good reason for that. Now they're good people, they protect you, and they're smart, and they're trying to work in your best interests, but they do slow things down sometimes. But as a product manager, you've got to deal with it. You have to deal with intellectual property, and that includes copyright, trademark, patents, and trade secrets, uh, e-commerce law, payments, advertising, spam, privacy, especially if you're doing anything to do with kids, okay? HIPAA, which is the Health Insurance Profit and Portability Act, at, at least that's US. EU's got even stricter rules. But you have, to, you have to be involved with all this to make sure your product doesn't go out there and do any of this. Why? Because it could hurt you very, very badly. Why? Because if you screw it up as a product manager, it's your fault. It's not the developer's fault if you miss this. Okay? This is part of your job. And it's a painful part of your job because it doesn't really produce value. Okay? It's something you have to do to check off the box to do it. It's a hurdle you have to get over. But it's part of your job. Minimum viable product. Talked about this a little bit. You guys all know about MVP at this point, right? Everybody knows this stuff. Frank Robin, it started out as an idea. Who's the customer? What are their needs? What can you offer? Oh, hold on. This looks, oh, this looks kind of like it's always been. Is this really new? Maybe. The idea of an MVP to just create the prototype and test, learn, fast, and iterate, that's the part that's a little bit new. Some people that talk about lean marketing and stuff, let's get to know the customer, let's do a design sprint. Those are fancy new words to try to make cool the same thing we've always done. What's different is the really fast iterations into the marketplace. But I have news for you. I already said this. Let me skip. Uh, okay. The point is, you, you can't always use that method. I had one client I was working with uh, before I came to work with Rails that, that had a really old school kind of client base. And they had this beautiful new design they wanted to do. And it was better. The UI was better. The UX was better. Everything about this was so much better. They couldn't just launch it. Because you can't just change the UI and UX on powerful customers like that. They wouldn't tolerate it. I had to change it slowly, carefully, over time. That was really, really hard. Okay, because because you're gonna you have to morph slowly. And if you look at brand, brand does this too. You guys familiar with Pepsi Cola? I mean Coca Cola is here. I don't see it. Pepsi. But look at logo. If if you go to Google and type in history of logos, and you you hit images, and you can find companies. You can see the history of logos. A smart company doesn't just change a the logo. They change it slowly over time. Have you guys ever? If you ever gone shopping at the supermarket and a package changed design, like let's say I buy the same soup every time I go to the market. And one day I show up, I'm looking for my soup and I can't find it. Why? It's right there in the same place. Somebody radically changed the packaging. I couldn't find it. They decided the value of the new packaging was important. But it, t it took me a moment to find that. But if you change a digital product to where somebody really goes, wh what happened? Remember, from UI UX perspective, what, what is any page supposed to do? It's three things. Why am I here? What can I do here? What should I do next? So if you're designing pages and somebody lands there and it's, it's not clear what they can do, whether it, that's the information architecture is wrong or the labels are wrong, you failed them if you, if you can't answer all three of those questions. Well, 
these are the kind of things you can't do. So sometimes it's hard to implement change, even if it's the right change. So lean doesn't ne lean and agile don't necessarily work in some of those environments. Uh, validate learnings. Talked about that. Do, 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 do. Oh, this is important. I don't care what methodology you use. Use waterfall. Use lean. Use use lean green waterfall. You know, there's things called scrummerfall, which is like scrum and waterfall put together. And some people say it derisively, like meanly, like like that's horrible, like you're disgusting. And then there's scrum ban, which is scrum and kanban put together. Right? Doesn't matter what you're doing. Your goal is to deliver business value, not to practice a method. And I'm running out of time, so I'm going to keep going. We're going to skip mobile because you guys all know this stuff. Marketing and branding. All right, we're coming to the end here. Real quick on branding. Again, <laughs> we could spend five days just on branding. Basic branding, paid, earned, and owned media. The difference is, of course, I pay for media. I can buy ads. Earned, public relations. People talk about me or share me socially. Owned media. It's my own website, my own white papers, and so on and so forth. The front page of this presentation had Rails Reactor on it. Owned media. You guys are here. You now know about Rails Reactor. Okay. Customer service. Branding is a promise made over time. This is the best definition I've ever heard of it. What does that mean? I could tell you, oh, I'm Coca-Cola, I'm the real thing, I'm this and that. Pick your favorite product. Pick your feelings about your favorite product, whatever it is. Like if I asked each of you individually to name some of your favorite products and what you thought about them and what their branding is, you could probably tell me. <coughs> but it's a promise made over time. There's a McDonald's somewhere in town here, right? Some big, ugly American McDonald's down there somewhere with the nasty hamburgers. Here's the thing about that. I don't really care for those burgers. Every so often I'll have one because it's convenient. But the thing is, I know what I'm going to get there. All right, I could walk into that McDonald's, and I can walk into one anywhere on this planet, and they are everywhere. And I'm going to understand what my experience, the language may be different, the money may be different. Right, but I'm going to understand what my experience is going to be, because every touch point is the same. Every touch point you have with your customer. And I don't think this is well understood in our industry. Every time somebody has to call you on the phone for a customer service, every time they click on something, every time it's hard for them to read something on your website, every time they can't click on something on mobile, every time your app crashes, every time they're walking down the street and they maybe see an ad for your product, every single touch point with your customer becomes part of your brand. It's a promise made over time. And that changes over time. Their perspective changes over time based on what? How you, as a product manager, control their experience or offer them that experience. So if you didn't go through that, all those other exercises, <coughs> you don't know what those touch points are. You don't even know you have a problem. Oh, but your competitor might, because maybe Deem is a better product manager than I am. And he remember, he wants what I want. And he sees my customer. And he sees their suffering with my pain. So he comes out with something else. Ooh, ooh, new bright, shiny thing. I'm going over here. I lose. All right. If you're a product manager, you better be paying attention to that. And if you missed your customer's pain point, you better be watching for him. So at least you can say, oh, I better fix this. OK? So a brand is a mental shortcut. That's what brands really are. <coughs> I went to the supermarket the other day down the street. And it was fun for me. It was interesting. And somehow I got away with it because I was wearing a dark jacket and whatever, whatever. And I, I, I have some money that looks like your money, OK? So I put some things in my cart, and I brought it up to the, to the, to the nice lady. She wasn't very nice, actually. Um, I put it there. She totaled all my stuff up. And she said, blah, 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 blah. I, I had no idea what she said. And I said, but I could see the number. So I gave her I said, thank you. I, I said, no, that's, that's all, please. And she said, oh, what? Because I guess I was in a place that Americans don't typically go. Like downtown or different places, a lot of people here speak English, and that's that's wonderful for me. It's American privilege, whatever you want to call it. But I sometimes don't care. I go wherever I go, and that's not always maybe a good idea. But I don't really care. I do it anyway, and I've I've got an app that can translate for me a, a little bit. It's wrong, so these guys said it was wrong anyway. But the point is, she was surprised. She was surprised. But I shopped there, and it was hard for me to buy things. I can't read. Now, thankfully, we live in a time. I mean, I can read English. It's OK. Um, I was able to read some of the packages. It's OK if it's cheese. I can see it. But what about packages I can't see into? I couldn't buy those things. I, don't, I might not like that. I might be allergic to it. Who knows? 
right? But a brand is different. If I had seen a McDonald's, as much as I don't personally love McDonald's, maybe I would have gone there because I'd know what I was getting. I'd be comfortable, okay? And if I see a package in one of your stores, because you guys sell a lot of things that, that I recognize, mm -hmm. brand, it's a mental shortcut. It allows me to make a decision. What does that mean? It, it's really about trust, isn't it? That I, that I know what I'm going to get, even if it's not something I like, but it's a known quantity. Think about what you have to do as a new product developer. You have to overcome the fact that not only are you new <coughs> and better, but you have to be better enough that you can overcome somebody else's habit pattern, somebody else's behavior, and somebody else's trust in something they've used. That's hard. Uh, brands work because thinking is hard. We're also risk averse. People, human beings in general, we are more afraid of loss than we are excited about gain, okay? There's been a lot of experiments about this. I'm more afraid of, of losing $10 than I am excited about getting $10. There's a lot of reasons why. I'm not going to go into loss aversion and all the behavioral psychology behind that. Behavioral economics and behavioral psych psychology is something you're probably interested in as a product manager. If not, you should be. Oh, think of your brand as a hidden dimension, one of those intangible dimensions of your product. Uh, you might not have to deal with branding, all right, because your chief marketing officer might do that. Uh, but if it's your responsibility, you know, and so on and so forth, okay, we don't need to spend a lot of time on that. Being a product manager, okay, this is the end. If those of you who don't do it and you're thinking about getting into it, a lot of times it's going to feel like this. Rolling the stone uphill. It's going to come back down on you, all right? Sometimes, yay, I win. It's going to feel like that, all right? So you do get those moments. That's nice. Mostly, it's going to be like this, just like it always is. It's never ever, ever going to be like this, okay? If this is what you want to do, you're in the wrong industry, all right? So in some ways, you have the best job in the company. It's great. You get to work with everybody. I get to work across all departments. I get to work with smart developers. I get to work with interesting clients. I get to do all kinds of different things. The problem is I have full responsibility, sometimes with no authority whatsoever. Hardly anybody works for me. Developers don't work for me. They don't have to do what I tell them. Other people don't work for me, all right? Measuring my success, how? I don't know, because the product did well? It's all up to your perspective. Product management might fall under the CTO or the CIO. I don't know. It depends. Again, we're going faster here. Uh, it's a highly ambiguous role, even in companies where it's well-defined. We help um, define the value for customers. You're going to have to float a bit. You're going to have to move across all of this. And it, it's hard sometimes. Uh, okay, we don't need to go over this. Everybody read this? Great. S so, so how do you tell your mom what you do? No, I don't write code, mom. I don't make art. No, I don't really close sales. I, I don't really have profit and loss responsibility with the spreadsheet. When things go well, you're going to give credit to others. When things go badly, you're going to take most of the blame, okay? You win together. I said this to somebody today. We were talking about this, I think. You win together, but you're going to fail alone, all right? And you actually do a lot of stuff, but if you're doing it right, if you're doing your job right, no one's really going to notice, okay? And you have to get your head around that. Product manager sits here. That's the usual graphic. I made one like this. It's actually here. You're in between a whole lot more stuff. And there's a whole lot more, but this presentation was already way too long. Thank you for sitting through it. Uh, this is what we went over. This is other things we care about, but that's it.